Hey everyone, Steve here with Phantom History. Thanks so much for checking us out on YouTube, and if you enjoy our content, make sure you subscribe. Enjoy this episode. Thank you for tuning in to Phantom History. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, TikTok, YouTube, and Instagram. And don't forget, you can also visit Phantom History House, a paranormal-themed bed and breakfast experience in Tampa, Florida. Visit phantomhistoryhouse.com for more details. Enjoy this episode. The ten-year-old boy knew his mother was leery about him playing with the Ouija board, but when his friend came over to visit, they decided to see exactly what it could do. Things started pretty quietly in the upstairs bedroom that shared a wall with the rest of the attic, but then the planchette started to move. Interestingly, it wasn't that movement that frightened the boys. No, it was the floating man's face hovering outside the second-story window that scared them. Ken Trulock, who was the 10-year-old boy who lived in that house, says that this is just one of the many experiences he had growing up in a haunted house in Indiana. I'm Steve Blanchard. Welcome to Phantom History. Today, Ken Trulock works as a ghost tour guide in and around Indianapolis, Indiana. He also conducts tours in the nearby town of Westfield. He's had an interest in history and the paranormal for as long as he can remember. Most of that interest was sparked when he lived in a small town north of Indianapolis called Atlanta. He said that childhood home that his family rented had almost constant paranormal activity from the moment they walked through the front door. It all started, he said, with dreams that he, his parents, and his sister all seemed to share about the previous family that inhabited the home and whom none of them had met. The weird thing about it is, is all four of us would have dreams and they would be the same dreams. And I remember a conversation with my mother who said, oh, oh yeah, I, you know, the quaddies, they look like this. And we were, we were talking about describing them. And then we really got to talking and it's like, nobody had ever seen a picture of them. So I went digging through the trunk that was in the attic and way at the bottom of the trunk, there were a pile of pictures. But right at the bottom, there was a picture of Bill and Edna. And it was the same picture. I, the descriptions were uncanny. These are the folks that lived there in the 1920s that built the house, you know. Ken says that as a boy, he had seen the trunk, but had never dug deep inside it until after the conversation with his family about the shared dreams. He also notes that the previous family, the Quaddies, appeared not only in their dreams, but as apparitions both inside and outside of their new home. A couple of times that we saw her, uh, you would catch a glimpse of her standing at the sink in the kitchen. You would be walking through, turn your head, and out of the corner of your eye, you would see somebody standing there, and it didn't necessarily register immediately what it was. But as you turned back, you could very clearly see it was her. She was usually standing at the sink as if she was preparing a meal. And she would she would be visible no more than a few seconds and she would just fade into nothing. He, you usually saw in the barn, uh, he was a little bit more sporadic than she was. Uh, but I remember the most vivid sighting of him was watching out of the kitchen window one morning, watching him walk out of the barn he was so solid at that point i thought it was it was somebody that had slept in the barn overnight you know a hitchhiker or whatever uh and as he was walking across the barnyard he just faded into nothing um probably probably the most vivid sighting of either of them between the two the spirits of the original owners of the home were more than residual according to ken in fact he said he nor his family feared the apparitions of the man and the woman who likely built the house in the 1920s. The woman, he said, was even considered a protector of sorts. I think they were active. Uh, we had always discussed uh, the fact that despite being in an older house, despite being kids and doing things we probably shouldn't do, um, you know, kids get into all kinds of stuff where they put themselves into danger. 
there was there always seemed to be in that house regardless of what else went on a, a protective hand there um things that we should have gotten injured much much worse and the activities that we were doing we didn't um falling off the roof <laughs> jumping jumping off the roof um didn't get hurt uh things like that that we did it just seemed like there was always kind of a protective spirit there and we always felt that was her and in my experience since then if you get something that is actively protecting you and i have talked to people who have experienced similar things that tends to be a more intelligent haunting but that's not to say there weren't darker, possibly more malevolent spirits in the house of Ken's childhood. Not too long after his family moved in, he says the family began noticing strange sounds throughout the house. Things were, things were a little bit more paced when we moved in, but we definitely noticed things. Mostly what we noticed when we moved in started off as small things that you could attribute to, oh, the house is settling or the house is creaking. Uh, things that sounded like uh, footsteps upstairs when nobody was upstairs. Um, uh, there was uh, sometimes some knocking in the basement, which we attributed to old pipes. Um, didn't really think a whole lot about it uh, until things started to intensify. And things intensified rapidly, according to Ken. One of the first spirits Ken saw in the house was when he was about 10 years old or so. He recalls that he had a friend over and the two boys decided to play with a Ouija board in his second story bedroom, which happened to share a wall with the attic. I remember um, having a Ouija board, which my mother was always very leery of. Uh, and I had a friend come over and we tried it. And I was up in my bedroom, which is on the other side of the attic wall. Um, we were doing this Ouija board, and as I said, little things had happened, nothing, nothing much. And I remember at one point, the Ouija board started moving, and it was always that back and forth, are you moving it? Am I moving it? Are you moving it? Um, but it was starting to spell things out, and I don't remember at this point exactly what the messages was were, but I remember thinking, oh, those are very clear, <laughs> and looked over, um, never had curtains in my room. And I looked over at my second floor window and there was a man's face floating outside the window. And my friend saw it and we just sat there looking at it for a while and thinking, is this real? Because there's no, way. I mean, we, we were on the second floor. There's no way. Um, and <laughs> It finally just disappeared and we didn't talk much about it after that. But that I remember that kind of being the time when things started picking up pretty significantly after that. Despite feeling a protective presence from the apparitions of the couple who built the house, Ken said that the increased activity in the home made him uncomfortable. In fact, he said that at one point, so many strange things happened, especially in his second story room, that he thought it was best to relocate downstairs. So I would be lying in bed at night, the, my headboard was up against the wall, and there were many nights where I would, I would sleep all night with blankets up over my head because you could hear things talking on the other side of the wall. You could hear scratching on the other side of the wall and these weren't mice we had mice i i knew mice these were like deliberate scratching it got to the point where things would bang on the wall it got to the point where my door would open uh it got to the point where the attic door would open and when that started happening that was enough because his parents had experienced some strange activity of their own in the house Ken said they were comfortable with him claiming space on the first floor as his new bedroom. While that prevented the sounds of scratching and voices and other strange noises from coming through the wall near his head, the doorway leading upstairs to his former bedroom wasn't too far from his newly relocated bed, and that managed to keep him up at night. I took over the old dining room, and that was my, that was my bedroom. And 
that doorway to the upstairs was in the dining room. And I would be laying there late at night and whatever it was, despite the fact that that door was blocked off, the door would open anyway. And you could hear something walk across the floor and set on the edge of the bed. And you could feel the pressure as it pushed down on the bed. And you were laying there with your eyes closed and you would turn around and you would open your eyes and it would be shadowed against the two windows that were behind it very clearly and very solid. It, it, it was very terrifying. Uh, and I would, I would tend to like reach up behind me and fumble for the light switch and flip the lights on full bright. And of course, as soon as that happened, it disappeared. And then I would go looking for my sister, trying to figure out, were you in my room? Was, was some somebody there? And it was usually 2.30 in the morning. So no, nobody was there. Ken says he was unable to identify who, or what, the strange energy was in the upper level of the house. He doesn't think it was associated with the couple who built the home, however, and said that it was much more aggressive than any of the other energies or spirits in the home. That entity, or that energy, scared the holy bejesus out of us sometimes. Uh, seemed to Seemed to revel in it. Uh, he was the one that would, not only you would hear footsteps upstairs, but they were very heavy footsteps, very deliberate footsteps, almost like stomping. Um, uh, he was the one that I had a hutch when I was younger, uh, a desk and a hutch set. And the hutch was attached to the desk with brackets. They were screwed in and no less than three times the hutch fell over as if it were pushed, and when you look, the screws were completely out. That would open the downstairs door, um, and my mom would get so nervous when she was there during the day hearing the footsteps upstairs, because as things intensified, that intensified as well. She would take a butter knife and slide in between the door jam and the door to hold the door into place, because the door would constantly be found open. And it, it would latch. There was no reason why it should be, but it was constantly open. Despite not knowing exactly what the entity was that was causing so much chaos in the house, Ken and his family started to uncover something dark, yet incomplete, about the house's past. Just like before, his family started sharing similar dreams, but this time, they were much more violent and seemed to impact overnight guests as well as the permanent residents of the home. The dreams would be from the perspective of a woman, very definitely female, running away from a male. And at some point, it was very evident that this male was chasing her with intent to do harm. I, I can't tell you how many times I had that dream. Not only did I have that dream, but there were several people in my family that had the same dream that, that only came out much later. And I also remember my cousin who was there visiting with my aunt. She was nine, 10 at the time. She, wa she was uh, asleep in my bedroom upstairs and we heard her wake up screaming. She was yelling, he's going to get me, he's gonna get me, he's chasing me, mom, mom, help. And when we got her calmed down, she was describing the same thing. Bad man is chasing me, bad man is chasing me. At some point, uh, that dream that a lot of us had started going a little bit farther and my mother always said that she had a dream that there was a there was a woman who got stabbed in the house now when she was out cleaning out under there was a, a grapevine that they had planted probably when the house was built uh, and it was an old grapevine and there was a lot of uh, stuff that was underneath and she was out there digging out underneath it, just to kind of clean it up to see if we could get grapes to grow again. And she was digging in and found 
a woman's pair of nylons that had a knife wrapped in it. <laughs> Never forget when she pulled that out of the ground. I was at home at the time. I think my sister was home at the time. And she said, look at this. And it looked like, it almost looked like, it reminded you of nurses' nylons, the old white stockings. They were horribly dirty, but you could still see where they had been white. And there's the rusty knife wrapped up in it. What the heck? As far as Ken knows, there is no historical evidence of a murder in his childhood home or of a missing or slaughtered nurse that captured headlines near his hometown. So it's a piece of the puzzle that he says he just doesn't have when it comes to the historical part of his experience as a child and teenager. He also admits there is even more about the house that he may never know, mostly because there were two locations within it that he never dared to explore even as a curious preteen. There was a crawl space in part of the basement. The entire basement, the length of the basement was completely dug out, but there was one space to the right side back of the basement that had cinder block wall up like a retaining wall. And it was three quarters or seven eighths up all the way up to the ceiling. And you had, it was filled with dirt at the back and to get back there, it was like a crawl space you had to get in. But it looked like at one time it had been dug out, so nobody could figure out. Always got the heebie-jeebies back there. Did not like it back there, would not go in. Um, there was a, an access trap door above the hallway. To this day, I do not know what's up there because I would never open that access way, ever. Eventually, Ken and his family did move away from the house. And he said that no one seemed to bring any bad energy, entities, or apparitions along with them. In fact, the family's lives quieted down, paranormally speaking. But, two decades after his family left, Ken and his sister had an opportunity to explore their childhood home one last time. And even then, Ken says, there was still something very dark and all-consuming about the old building. My sister became a realtor. And when the house went up to, for market, I told her, I said, I want to go look at it. And we went back out. And it, first of all, it is amazing to me how very little that house had changed in the ensuing 20 years. I, it still had the same paint on the walls that we put on. Uh, some of the stuff, the old ringer washer downstairs that we used, it was still sitting in the basement as if we had just walked out. And whatever it was in, in the attic, whatever it was that was the more aggressive, still there. And in fact, I caught him on camera. I got a picture. The one nice thing about Apple iPhones is the live photos, little three second snippets. And you can see a shadow figure pulling out of the attic right at the end of that shot. And it, was pretty, it, was, it was a pretty cool validation. Thank you to Ken Trulock for sharing his story of growing up in a haunted house just north of Indianapolis, Indiana. To learn more about Haunted Indiana, join Ken on a tour of Indianapolis or of Westfield, a town just north of the city, as part of the many tours offered by Unseen Press. For more information and tour dates, find Unseen Press on Facebook or visit their website at unseenpress.com. Music for this episode was provided by Silverman Sound, Chad Crouch, Daniel Birch, and Purple Planet Music. Remember to follow Phantom History on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok, and visit phantomhistoryhouse.com to learn more about my paranormal-themed bed and breakfast in Tampa, Florida, and sign up for our newsletter to stay up on event announcements, special deals, and new episodes of this podcast. Hear my full interview with Ken on our sister podcast, Conjuring Phantom History. And, as always, thanks for listening. Hey, thanks so much for watching that. Remember, go to phantomhistory.com and sign up on the newsletter so you are alerted when we have a new podcast. And check out our new bed and breakfast at phantomhistoryhouse.com where you can book your stay and we can talk ghost stories in person in the library. See you then.